Before we start this episode, I want to tell you about an amazing true crime podcast. Jamie Snow is serving life in prison for a crime he says he didn't commit. Now, listen as he tells the story from Stateville Prison in Crest Hill, Illinois, in The Snow Files. Season 1 focused on the trial and presented new witness evidence and taped interviews never before revealed, while Season 2 covered forensics. In September, a judge ruled Jamie should be given nearly 8,000 documents that were withheld from him and his attorneys. This is the first time he has received relief in 22 years. The final season of The Snow Files, which is now available, wraps it up with a deep dive into the alternative suspects and other wrongful convictions in McLean County that were presided over by the same state's attorney. Together with co-hosts Bruce Fisher, Tammy Alexander, Leslie Pires, and Ray Wilson, listen to Jamie tell a story about his wrongful conviction guaranteed to make you laugh, cry, and shock you to the core. He not only tells you his story, but he interacts with listeners and answers questions. New episodes of The Snow Files are released every other week, and you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Or download Jamie's case files and listen directly at snowfiles.net. My name is Charlie Moss, and I've been a freelance journalist and writer for more than 10 years. I've written for The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, and other publications. I also used to work for an online camping magazine called The Dirt. It was there that I wrote about a haunted campground just outside of Stanton, Virginia. The more I dug into the story, the more I realized that this wasn't just a simple Halloween ghost tale. It was something much deeper, much more profound than I ever imagined and I've spent the last three years finding out as much as I can about what happened at Braley Pond. This is Episode 7, A Portal to Another World. Well, the Pleiadians are a race of, of, of beings that are actually living in the incarnation now. They're not in spirit forms. So that's really important for people to understand, that they are in physical bodies, um, and they come from what is called uh, the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters, a, a, a configuration of a group of stars. And their mission in this lifetime is to support um, Earth in this current transition that we're all going through. They also um, come, <laughs> there's also a reptilian form of Pleiadian. Uh, which, you know, most human beings would have a real aversion to uh, because of our our ego minds. Uh, but they are also highly evolved and they are also play a very powerful role here on the earth right now. You just heard Christine Day, an internationally known spiritual teacher, healer, author, and Pleiadian ambassador. Yes, you heard that right. She talks to Pleiadians, or channels them, then spreads the Pleiadian messages with anyone who's willing to listen to her. Her website says, and I quote, She inspires people with a clear frequency of truth that she transmits out as she speaks. She carries a pure energy of love that can be experienced throughout the audience. End quote. Notice that this is a pretty different interpretation of what a Pleiadian is than what Logan described in the last episode. So I specifically asked Christine about this during our phone conversation. It's why I reached out to her in the first place. Do they ever come in like a shadow form? And I asked this specifically because one of the, one of the people I've talked to um, has mentioned something called a shadow king, and then he's got people that come in from another dimension, but they're instead of... Okay, uh, so you're talking about something different. Let me just give you sure. a little bit of um, uh, fact here. We, we, you know, we are living in a, a multi-dimensional reality space, so there are many things happening... Um, different different things happening in these fast reality states that exist here on planet Earth, even. So these different reality states, uh, there are doorways into those, and, and so you can you can those shadows that show shadow states of energy come from they're actually on Earth in of this alternate reality state here on the planet on a multi-dimensional level so that's very different from the Pleiadians who don't 
do not live here. They come to work with us and um, they, they, they're on their ships, but they don't live in those ultimate reality states, that, which would be that shadow is more coming from that state rather than um, the Pleiadians from, from their own um, dimensional uh, space where they live. So it's very different. I dig a little deeper into Logan's shadow beings theory because I'm genuinely confused about the different interpretations I've heard from Logan and Christine. Like, the way that he described them is that, um, I mean, they were basically out to basically steal the souls of the living. Is that... No, that no, that is absolutely accurate at all. You know, there's a lot of stories going out there, a lot of misconceptions and misperceptions. Right now... And these 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 energies from the other alternate reality states are nothing but supporting Earth and supporting humanity. They're supporting humanity to be self-empowered to activate a change here on on planet Earth. Um, you're not going to get there are no one there are no no beings trying to steal a, a souls. Uh, that's not happening. And actually, the Galactic Council is overseeing Earth right now to make sure that there are no negative forces coming in to interfere with our progress and our, our awakening. So before we get into Christine's story, let's go back to something she mentioned at the very beginning of this episode. You know, the lizard thing. I asked Christine more about this, because if you remember the old TV show V, that's exactly what came to mind when she said that. Well, they've certainly got scales and tails and walk on, you know, two legs, but they very, very much are, are reptilian in form. And um, most of, um, like a lot of my students often, you know, regularly see the Pleiadians. Um, with our Pleiadian work that we do, they, uh, they appear and, and come in to um, make themselves known to people who are ready to receive them but mostly they come in the humanoid form rather than the reptilian form. Christine explains to me that she, in fact, has a Pleiadian living inside her. Babe, I have a Pleiadian aspect of me that is fully integrated through me through my experiences 26 years ago. And so they, they come from a, 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 a higher evolution than Earth right now, a, um, from a fifth dimensional, sixth dimensional evolution of unconditional love. Um, so they have fully aligned to their own aspect of God light and they vibrate at a much higher rate than we do. So when you look at their physical form, it's like a vibrating light mass. A light mass. Um, and they're very tall um, and you'll see a light vibrating like humanoid form. It's fascinating to me, this whole Pleiadian belief system and how different Christine's perspective is from what Logan told me. Unlike Logan, or even Shay, her abilities weren't something she was born with. 26 years ago, something profound happened to Christine that changed the way she looked at our world. It was her gateway, if you will, into a whole other level of thinking. When I was 31, I was given a few months to live. I had systemic lupus. And when I was in the hospital getting that diagnosis, I was told that I would only have a few months to live. And I realized when they told me that, that actually I wanted to die. And then just after that realization, I realized I'd created something to kill myself. And I had a background. I was given to a cult when I was two. So I was in cult ritual abuse from two to 13. And I really had never dealt with any of that pain. It was all really locked down inside of me. And so I realized if I could create something to kill myself, I could create something to heal myself as well. And I left hospital that day realizing that if I was going to live, I, would have to, I couldn't afford to do anything the same again. At this point in her life, Christine was depressed and felt connected to nothing. Once she got home from the hospital, she began meditating on a whim because she felt like she needed some answers to her life about her past and her path toward the future. What she realized was that for so long, she felt powerless when it came to the direction her life was going. But when she confronted death and the trauma of being in a cult as a child, she began to feel like maybe she could take control of her life again. 
there was a power to confronting her mortality. So in that process, I was sitting, and after a few weeks, suddenly I had this light coming through me. Now this light came through me, and it was like, it was like a love that I had never experienced in my life on this planet. Not that I'd had love as a child, believe me, but it was like I was receiving this love and it never stopped. It was just there day and night. And so I called it God because I thought it must be God. And I just received that energy of that light. And as I did, I went into healing. I started to, my lupus, systemic lupus started to heal inside of me. So when that completed itself, it was like I was committed to moving from death to life. And so I then started to put my hands on people and the light that was coming through, everyone I touched started to experience healing and joy. Christine tells me she attributed this revelation to God, but she found out six years later that it was something else entirely. I was walking out in nature and turned a corner into a meadow and there was this huge Pleiadian ship. I mean, it was huge. And there was this group of Pleiadians walking towards me. And I would have run if I could, believe me, because it was, it was, it was a shocking experience. But my, they were actually my Pleiadian family, but I didn't know that at the time. And they grabbed me telepathically and connected to me through that, bypassing my ego fear, and reminded me of my pre-agreement to come here, reminding me of my past, of my Pleiadian, of my life on the Pleiades with my family, of the work I was to do here, um, and I, and and it was just a very, very amazing, profound experience, but extreme. And I don't even remember getting home that day. I found myself in bed with this incredible light flowing through me, and it was my own Pleiadian frequency coming into my physical body. Christine says she was bedridden for two months after her encounter with the Pleiadians. She felt this overwhelming light and energy, this physical transformation that she couldn't quite explain, at least not rationally. And she wanted nothing to do with it. But then something changed her mind. So it was about six weeks into being in bed, and I was visited by a by these angels that said, you know what, the Pleiadians are part of the God consciousness state. You are part of the God consciousness state. There is no separation. This is your journey. So I really opened up to commit to my mission, which was to bring the teachings of the Pleiadians to the world. So what are these teachings that the Pleiadians want Christina to share with our world? Yes, it's the new dawning, and we are going through phases of this new dawning. And what the Pleiadians are saying is we are going to be successful in this transmutation. Our mission for this lifetime is self-resurrection, is really to move from our humanity to awaken to our full sacred selves. And they say this is going to happen in this lifetime on this planet. We will all awaken. Some will awaken before others. Christine compares this awakening process to waking up from a dream. As she's talking to me, I'm imagining something similar to the Matrix. And suddenly we just remember, and I'll be like, oh, here I am. Okay, I had that human experience. But it's not, that's what happens generally when we die. But in this, at this time, we're all going to not leave these physical bodies. We're just going to remember. And that's, that's part of the prophecy of the new dawning. For Earth and planet Earth will never, ever again be a third dimensional planet where people come to live out their human existence. This is a lot for me to take in because, from what I've gathered, she's saying that Earth as we know it will soon no longer exist. Humans will no longer just be humans once we move into our awakening process, will be something much more powerful. But to do this, we have to listen to the Pleiadians via their ambassador, Christine. The Pleiadians say we just have to accept our imperfection. Accept our humanity and know that we're perfectly imperfect in our human experience. And that's never going to change. And it's just self-acceptance of our idiosyncrasies and imperfection will move us into our awakening process. So it's, it's a beautiful story and it's a pure story and a story of truth. 
And that's my role, is to unveil those mysteries and make it really simple in how people can reconnect to that sacred piece of themselves and awaken. Okay, remember earlier when Christine mentioned something about a galactic council? I, of course, go straight to Star Wars, right? You probably do too. I asked Christine about this because it just seems too much, you know, like straight out of a TV show or movie or sci-fi novel. Well, the Galactic Council are, um, as, as the word says, galactic. They are from the Galactic Federation. And the Galactic Federation is made up of, of all, all the diverse life force groups that exist within our resident universe. And these, these, diver, these groups have representation on the Galactic Council. The Galactic Council, all it does is oversee, is overseeing this current transition of Earth if from, a, from a, just a third dimensional planet into a higher consciousness planet. You know, the, the, the evolution of our full universe rests with the last planet to fall in line on an energetic standpoint. And so um, if this galactic council overseas creates a balance of energy, keeping everything steady and stable during this time of upheaval. And, and so the Pleiadians are part of a universal team to support Earth, and they are playing a very strong profile, a large profile here on Earth right now. As Christine explains this to me, I equate all of this to some strange religious cult. So I ask her if she considers this to be a sort of religion. I think what I think it is, is it's definitely a path, a spiritual path. It's a path of self-empowerment. It's not me being a leader or a guru. It's encouraging each person to link into their own vastness of their own light of their sacred. And that in that is self-empowerment. Um, and there's no control. It's about everyone being encouraged to be where they need to be and to be in their own experience of self-empowerment and to seek out their truth that exists within their own heart. I agree with the self-empowerment message for sure. But it all sounds so strange. Way beyond Shay's stories of stalking creatures and Logan's shadow people theory. I found myself wanting to know more. Christine has thousands of followers. Her YouTube channel alone has almost 14,000 subscribers. Are there other Pleiadian ambassadors like her? Apparently there are. Robert Perala is an internationally acclaimed motivational speaker and author of two books, The Divine Blueprint and The Divine Architect. He refers to himself as a spiritual reporter and has been researching metaphysics, spirituality, past life experiences, extraterrestrial science, and earth-based anomalies for more than two decades. He's also a musician and a huge Paul McCartney fan. And yeah, then, and, I met uh, Macca himself. <laughs> he almost ran me over in his car one time. <laughs> really? Yes. He ran me over almost in his Corvette one day. <laughs> wow. It, it was like, then he got out and he apologized. <laughs> I mean, well, the and then everybody, as he drove as he drove to the front part of the parking lot to get in the door to the uh, to the hotel, everybody said, wow, that was big. You almost, you made it almost history news. You would have been run over and killed by Paul McCartney. That's big. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm like, yeah, I'd be the guy that was run over by Paul McCartney. That's just the kind of headlines my family would be very interested to see. Okay. Besides almost getting hit by McCartney, Robert also claims he's been abducted by aliens. Um, in uh, So I'm 65 years old now, and I'm still in the expos and still still rambling on with esoteric sciences. But in 1977, I was a young man that was in the... California Nevada border where it meets Lake Tahoe in that area and uh, I was on a skiing vacation was just reading about uh, you know that that thoughts were real things and that thoughts are tangible and have the ability to travel in the unseen ethers suffice to say I just did a meditation lit a candle and I just said if there's anything out there I'd like to to know uh, or I'd like to have some kind of experience and uh, so I, I did a uh, lit a candle, sent a thought form out to the night sky, went to bed, didn't think anything of it. 2.30 in the morning, I'm completely, utterly astonished to see that the entire room is lighting up in um, a silver 
like very brilliant light everywhere with speckles all over the place. They look like little blue, green, violet, indigo speckles uh, floating all over the place. And the light seemed to be so silver white. And it, it seems to be enveloping the whole room and down through the ceiling, as if it wasn't there, incredibly come down what looked like three astronauts of some kind. They were tall, eight, seven and a half, eight feet tall. They had silver, like, glowing suits. I didn't see any faces. They had, like, a visor in the front, a uh, flat helmet on the side, rounded at the top with an orange antenna, literally a robot. I mean, that's too much for people to take somewhat, so they're going to dismiss me, and I'm used to that. And and they're glowing. The, the suit itself even seemed to be alive. And of course, I had no idea what was happening. And so I started to scream because I, I just I didn't understand what this even was. And as I did, I was suddenly frozen, and I was placed in like a, a blue like sphere, like a, a cocoon of some kind, a lighted sphere of some kind. And I was suddenly held in like a suspended animation. And I can hear myself screaming still inside my head, but it doesn't seem like there's any sound. So let me pause right here for a minute. When I first started creating this podcast, I had no idea that I'd be talking to people about galactic councils, or in this case, giant glowing aliens. But that's where we are. Okay, here's Robert again. If you can imagine screaming inside your head in silence at the same time, that's what this seemed like. And then suddenly the side of the house dropped away. And there was a tunnel, you know, like they tell you in the movies. There was this tunnel of light. Well, there was a tunnel of light, <laughs> you know, and I somehow it was held in a suspended animation. I couldn't move. I didn't have any any way to resist it or even negotiate it, really. At this point, your mind doesn't even have room for that. And I dropped down through this tunnel and it picks up in speed as I'm going through this white and silver light now again with the speckles it's almost too much to take and at one point I thought I'm on fire you know you you can't live when you're on fire you know and I surrendered thinking I'm going to die and when I surrendered it sort of let go it was like oh it's sort of halfway pleasant you know but the minute I resisted it, it grabbed me again and it was terrifying the next thing I knew is I relaxed and suddenly the, the, the whole thing went away and I'm floating in like a, a sphere of some kind, in some kind of lighted sphere. It's illumined all the way around me. There's, there's really no floor that I remember or, or walls that were actually meeting each other. It just felt like it was a room, um, I don't know, maybe 700, 800 square feet, wasn't real big. And I'm just floating in this room, and everything is still. Robert says he was then hurled back into this intense light, floating above the townhouse he had rented. He felt himself gradually float down back into the bed in his room, surrounded by the three beings. And then they were gone. He then awoke the next morning, and there was no trace that anything had happened that night before. Robert rolled out of bed and crawled across the floor into the bathroom. I turned on the light, and I realized I was covered from head to toe in something like a a glue of some kind. It was some kind of um, uh, resistance, some kind of oil that's all over me. Robert discovered not only did he have oil everywhere, but he was also sunburned. That's when he lay down and went into a deep sleep. Then he woke up to his parents standing over him, trying to get him to wake up. I thought this must be some kind of strange dream. I mean, it must have been some physical weird dream. And uh, So I drove home and I didn't say anything. And I, then I got home and I locked myself in my townhouse. And I locked the door and I stayed in there for 10 days and didn't tell anybody about what this was. And um, so eventually I decided, since I haven't told anybody, it's time I find out maybe if this was even real, what happened. And I went to a, a, a bookstore and that's where I found... Um, you know, a book uh, you know, about... Uh, contacts and and uh, and other books. One of the books Robert bought was Alien Messages by Brad Steiger. In it, he read about a woman who had a similar encounter. I couldn't believe I was reading this. Called them, went and did an interview with her, 
she explained to me that you've had a contact with with uh, some kind of uh, physical form that is visiting here on a regular basis. And so, of course, that's it. And it, it changed my mind, my, my thoughts. I, I spent weeks, eventually told my parents. So what exactly did happen to Robert? Was it an alien abduction? Did he get beamed up to a spaceship? No, that's a very good question. That's the sort of the laws of the malleable reality you're referring to. In my case, I never actually saw a spaceship. That's not to say that whatever these beings, how they arrived, didn't come from one and then beam down somehow. That's very possible because that happens a lot with people. Well, so do you think it was like a near-death experience for you? Here's the catcher. In a near-death experience, you go out of your body, you're sort of a lighted spirit because that's who you really are. Your thoughts are really coming from the light that's around your body and it's connected to <clears throat> the third portion of you know, your, your forehead, the third eye, and, and portion of the conscious brain. Remember that whole third eye chakra phenomenon I referenced back in episode three? You know, when I started talking to Shay about indigo children? Robert's referring to the possibility of achieving a higher consciousness. And then, you know, sometimes in an accident or in an or in the hospital, you can step out and look at your body, and that's happened all the time. Uh, there, There's levels <clears throat> of that, I believe. There is the level of stepping out of your body, then there's levels of taking your body, you know, with you. I'm going to guess that that I took my body with me because there was physical residue afterwards, unlike people that sort of bounce into their body and suddenly feel this sort of slamming back into their body and like you do in a dream and your eyes pop open and you're lying in bed, this is a little more pronounced. It's what they call the malleable realities. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but I want to explain the concept of malleable realities. It's basically the idea that there's a collective unconscious or a global repository of all humankind's experiences across time. This creates a dual reality, one that is shared objective and one that is personally objective. Though Robert's still trying to figure out exactly what happened to him back in 1977, he knows one thing. It changed his life completely. And like Christine Day, it awakened him to a whole other reality, the malleable reality he just mentioned. It takes the whole sixth sense, I see dead people scenario to a completely different level. So you actually nobody's really walking alone. It feels like we do because we see the third dimensional reality in front of us. We see height, width, and depth all day long, tangible, visible. What we don't see is the ethers of people that are walking uh, past us. These can be lost loved ones that are checking in to see the, you know, how their, the responsibility of that person played out while they're in the material world and now they're not in the material world. They want to see how they grow and what happened to them. And they drop in and visits. There's a committee that is sort of assigned to you to see how you're growing on a number of cases, you know, mentally, emotionally, where how well you're starting to understand spiritual principles, uh, how well you'll embrace sort of um, the virtues is a big one, tolerance and selflessness and forgiveness and kindness and compassion, unconditional love, how you're growing as a soul. A committee? Does it mean there's a group of spirits that are assigned to us to basically mentor us as humans to help us grow to be better people? I just don't know how to take all this. And so we are in this learning plane of existence. There, there are these different check-ins that could be anything from a previous pet to your parents to a lost brother who passed over already that wants to see what happened with your life, what, what, what happened. And they, you can't see them. Once in a while you can feel them and once in a while you'll see them in your dream or once in a while you'll see them even as you are completely asleep and you wake up and you're, you're very, very, very relaxed. At that point, the third eye in your center of your forehead can open up a little bit and you, you people witness people standing by their bed for a few moments and speaking to them. I recently had my father do this, and my father appears to me. First time I'd seen him in, in ages. At the time I talked to Robert, the California wildfires were unrelenting. Trump was president, and the COVID pandemic had just started. And uh, I sobbed and knelt down and told him where I would, you know, what was happening to me, that I was evacuated. 
um, that the, the whole world is so different now. And I told him a little bit about, you know, we have a leader in the country I don't agree with, and we have uh, all kinds of challenges. And finally, we're now in the middle of a pandemic, and, we're, you know, and I've been evacuated, and we've been fearing for our lives. And it sort of visited me right at that crisis point when you are at a very low point. I was at a very, very low point. And so my dad visited me. And he, it's not like he spoke to me. I would love to say he spoke to me, he told me everything was going to be okay, he gave me the answer. No, he, he, he was slightly younger looking. He just looked on to me and beamed such uh, beauty. And I felt a calmness when I stood next to his. I leaned, or rather kneeled next to his spirit. He was sitting down. We have this all the time. Actually, you're walking through an atmosphere where people are walking right by you, and they hear your thoughts. Though I'm skeptical about all of this, as I've been about most everything I've heard when it comes to ghosts, shadow people, portals to other dimensions, and Pleiadians, there's something very soothing, something, something very reassuring about all of this. I mean, once I got over the thought of spirits walking by me and eavesdropping on my conversations all the time. Robert's story reminded me of my own interaction with my deceased father that I mentioned at the beginning of episode one. I feel the need to tell him about it. Yeah, my father died when I was 22, and he was not around. I, I met him for the first time when, uh, when I was 18, and so we kind of had this relationship for about four years, and then he died. And he lived in Texas. And I lived in Tennessee. And But when, after I came back from his funeral, um, I remember having, I was asleep, I, you know, sleep, it was in the middle of the night, and I was in bed, and, and I I distinctly, and I can still remember it to this day, is is I remember this, I felt this shoulder tap, and I and then I'm, all of a sudden it's black, I'm standing up, not in bed, and I turn around, and it's my father, but it's my father as, like he's dead. I mean, he's not, and, and I don't mean like a ghost, like he looked exactly the way he looked in his coffin, you know, before we buried him. And it was the same suit, same, you know, he was older, so he was 68 and he, you know, didn't take care of himself. So he's very, like his skin was gray and all this. And, and he just, he looked at me, turned around, he looked at me, but there was no life in him. And then he, and then he vanished in an instant and I screamed and was sweating and, and I, and I, for, for years I've been trying to figure out like, was that a dream? Like it felt so real. I don't know what that means. And I, and I don't, like I still don't know what that means. I think it's a visit. I think you probably had an authentic visit. There's some kind of laws in between material and non-material. It seems like those that visit us, aren't necessarily there's something there that is it may be in the way that they're not able to actually sometimes speak to us that's not to say that they don't because they i've in all my years of research i've done a lot of interviews i've given a lot of interviews i've hosted shows asked asked some of the best esoteric teachers out there and there seems to be a consensus that some visitations can't have a necessarily an intrusion or or a, a, a deeper uh, connection. It's more of an observance to let you know that they are actually there, um, but not necessarily, you can't necessarily engage with them like your experience. I don't know what to think about that. My relationship with my father was complicated. I always had a level of mistrust with him. As I mentioned in episode four, my father left my mom when my twin sister and I were born. I didn't hear from him until I was around 18. He lived in Houston, I lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So we only saw each other a handful of times. He died four years later. There were so many things I never got to ask him. So many things we never got to talk about. Robert spent a lot of time talking about birth and death, our time here on Earth, finding our purpose, and what happens after we die. How we spend time in the material world to live and learn from our experiences, and then how we take all that when we die to the other side, as he describes it, before taking on another incarnation. This actually makes sense to me. It's not unlike reincarnation, except without the karma part of it, right? I mean, there are different aspects there, but, but he's basically talking about this kind of circle of life and death, using our previous lives to be better versions of ourselves and future lives. But then he mentions this, and I once again have a hard time wrapping my brain around it. 
And there's more than one Earth out there. This isn't the only Earth even, I believe. I think that there are other Earths just like this that are in other distant aspects of creation. And um, But you are who you are because you're the result of everything you've been. It, it sounded also like you were talking about I mean, were you talking when you're talking about multiple Earths? Are you talking about like multiple dimensions, like interdimensional travel? Yeah, that too. Um, the interdimensional travel is sort of a way of the soul's journey to it. It somehow, somehow, and I'm just saying all this is sort of like this is subjective. So now that we're talking about other dimensions, I asked Robert how Pleiadians fit into all of this. In the lost books of Job, which aren't included in the King James version or the uh, standard version, you are descendants of the house of Pleiades. And it makes a reference is to um, the origin of the soul as coming from the Pleiades system of Cirrus. We seem to see that souls are commissioned to take a journey into the material world on Earth as an adjunct to their studies. Now, in the Pleiades, you have a series of central suns and planets that revolve in this area that's trying to be understood. And you have the central suns, which is Tigeta, Maya, Era, Electra, Alcyon, Merope. And astronomers are fascinated by this little cluster that looks like a little tiny, uh, little tiny dipper. And in this system, it has revolving uh, spheres that are very much like Earth, and they're in various degrees. Some are material just like you see now. Boom. Just like you see here. Uh, a physical reality with people, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, look just like us. Are you getting this so far? Because I'm having a hard time keeping up. There's other formations of there that are semi-etheric. So sometimes when people die and they return back to, the, say, the Pleiades, this area, they're living in a level that's just karmically sort of above the material world. We're, well, we're in the material world here. We're subject to everything you can imagine. Mistrust, you know, somebody poking you, uh, stealing from you. Um, you can't hear their thoughts. They can't hear your thoughts. Um, it's This is a very extraordinarily dense reality, Charles. This is like, wow. This is like, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say it's the bottom of the barrel. But it kind of is. In all the realities that exist, ours is basically the worst. This is a very difficult reality. And, and then some souls that do well rise up into other spheres. And those spheres are in the Pleiades, whereas uh, they don't have all of the setbacks that we have. Uh, we have we're set back with pollution, murder, uh, strange belief systems, um, billions living out of spiritual principle. They're not living in, in, they don't know what spiritual principles are. We're sort of above the ape and able to create things that can take the entire planet out uh, at this point as well, as you know. So we're sort of at that, we're at an intervention point, basically, where they could lose this experience for all the incoming karmic-bound souls that are due to be here. So, Okay. So, trying to. So are. So are we? I feel like this is all. I mean, I feel like this is everything we've talked about is connected, and I'm. I'm. I'm I guess I'm trying to, in my head, connect it all as far as like, you know. Are we in fact Pleiadians? Like, is that what you were yeah. saying, or like, yeah, we are. Yes, are just like you know, if you look through your lineage of your family who might be part German and part Canadian or whatever we have that sort of on a stel I believe we have that on a stellar level as well we're part Pleiadian we're part you know our soul has been in other systems that's that's a deep story but the, the origin of the soul is sort of telling a story that yeah we, we have a we have an origin in the Pleiades it's found in astrology I don't know about you but my brain hurts it sounds like Robert's take on Pleiadians seems to be similar to Christine's, except for the whole human lizard aspect. They both talk about the need for love and kindness, of being a good person, learning from your mistakes, all those kinds of things. And I can get behind that. But to be clear, none of this is science. None of this is based on facts. Not that I think that there's anything wrong with any of it. 
People are entitled to believe what they want to believe, as long as it's not hurting anyone else, right? All of this starts to make me wonder, what are the chances that all of what we've just heard is true? Could Pleiadians exist in some shape or form? Are there alternate dimensions? I've read my fair share of comic books, seen plenty of sci-fi TV shows and movies, so the idea of a multiverse or an upside down is not lost on me. But could this concept be real? And if so, what does it look like? I started Googling alternate dimensions, parallel universes, things like that, and I came across a series of news stories about a physicist named Dr. Leah Broussard at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in eastern Tennessee. She, along with a group of colleagues, is conducting experiments to see if there is, in fact, a parallel universe or an alternate dimension. Living in Chattanooga, Oak Ridge is only a couple of hours from me. So I took a trip there with my friend Monty, who absolutely geeks out over all things science. I asked him to come because I knew I was going to get in over my head. I took chemistry three times in high school, and the best I made in physics was the C. If my conversations with Christine and Robert were a bit taxing on me, I knew that talking to a professional physicists would require some translation. So Monty agreed to help. I'd never been to Oak Ridge before. My mom and uncle lived there briefly before moving to Chattanooga when they were kids. Honestly, I didn't know much about it, other than the town was created to accommodate the scientists who were working on the atomic bomb during World War II. I always imagined Oak Ridge to be this tiny little podunk town with these ramshackle houses left over by the U.S. government, a place that was kind of frozen in time. But as Monty and I drive into town, I'm surprised to see how beautiful it was. You can't go a mile or so without seeing a sign or a historical landmark noting its significance in the production of the atomic bomb. But Oak Ridge is very much a thriving community with plenty of modern amenities. Before visiting Dr. Broussard, Monty and I stop at the Manhattan Project Historical Park to learn a little about the history of the area. Here's what we learned. Oak Ridge was one of three secret locations picked by the federal government in 1942 as a production site for the top secret Manhattan Project. You know, the initiative authorized by President Roosevelt after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor a year earlier. The project was created to essentially end World War II by way of atomic bomb. Before it was called Oak Ridge, the 59,000 acres of land along the Clinch River was mostly farmland. The town was originally meant to accommodate 13,000 scientists, engineers, and other workers in prefabricated housing, trailers, and wooden dorms. But by 1945, it became Tennessee's fifth largest city at 75,000 citizens. A lot of the facilities there have closed since the end of the war, and the population declined to around 30,000 after a lot of the federal employees left, which is where the population stands today. When Monty and I arrive at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we realize what a massive facility it is. I mean, the whole campus is overwhelmingly huge. I can't help but take a moment to understand how much world-changing history has taken place here. Security here is stringent, so I can't record at all while we enter the building or wait to meet with Leah. We're promptly greeted and escorted to a meeting room where we meet Dr. Broussard. Yeah. Oh, my, my job title is scientist. Isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, too, I'm tickled by that. <laughs> um, what do you remember? Like, what was the first thing that really kind of inspired you and, uh, and, and made you think, you know, maybe I want to pursue, maybe I want to become a scientist, maybe I want to study physics? Well, that was always going to happen. Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm a very analytical person, I'm very thoughtful, careful. You know, I like to take things apart and think about them really care- carefully. And I, I don't think there was every, ever any doubt what, that I would be a scientist. Um, but I, I think there was certainly the influence, you know, in my early childhood. Uh, my, my grandfather was an engineer, and I was, I was the only one allowed in his library where he, he just ha- he had walls of, like, popular science and popular mechanics and, and even, you know, engineering journals and, and just really cool, like, you know, st- just stuff yeah, like that, that I could just go through and, and just lock myself in there and, and you know, just read. And <laughs> that, that was always me. And, you know, I had a, a science teacher in high school, uh, or Roland Potts, who, who basically... Uh, shook me by the shoulders and said, you're going to be a physicist, you know, it's... <laughs> Dr. Broussard is from a tiny Louisiana town in the heart of the Cajun region. Uh, my family has diligently traced out our family tree, and we, I can say that I'm, with, with full confidence, that I'm not sure that I'm anything but Cajun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, and that's, you know, that's, that's been a kind of a, a, a fun 
uh, part of my personality that I've brought to science. I hide uh, Mardi Gras references in all of my experiments. <laughs> some some I, I don't hide so well. I, you know, there's the, the picture of me that kind of went around is, is my, my greatest masterpiece. I managed to, uh, 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 through some deviousness, get my entire experiment Mardi Gras colored. <laughs> <laughs> Purple, green, and gold. So that's... Every, when people realized what was happening, they were like, no! <laughs> Leah! Ha, 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 ha. I'm going to be a mad scientist one day. That's, that's my plan. <laughs> mad Mardi Gras scientist. As a physicist, Dr. Broussard's specialty is neutrons. But she also does a lot of stimulation analysis and programming work. In the fields of nuclear and particle physics, there's an overwhelming amount of data that needs to be culled through. So Dr. Broussard and her peers have to be able to process it in a fast, organized way. So we start talking about Dr. Broussard's mirror universe experiment, exactly what it is, why she's doing it, things like that. So there's, there's background on my interest in it, and I guess there's background on people interested in, in mirror image universes. Um, the, the interest in the idea that there could be this mirror matter or this mirror universe uh, actually came from early on in our exploration of understanding how our own matter interacts. Uh, we know about four fundamental forces, you know, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, and the weak force. The weak force being the one that's responsible for nuclei, at atoms, uh, being radioactive and undergoing what we call beta decay. It, it emits an electron, which is what, what we now know what at the time we called the beta particle, um, and transforms into another nucleus. Uh, that process is, is a little funny. Um, it, it disobeys a symmetry that, as far as we know, all the other forces seem to obey. It actually seems to care whether a particle is right-handed or left-handed, and that made a lot of people very unhappy. It's, it's strange. I mean, we actually today, we still don't understand why that is. And so the original idea was, well, you know, our universe is left-handed. Perhaps there's another set of particles and forces or another universe of, of like ours that's, that's right-handed and that maybe that's how we can restore that symmetry. Okay, so if you're like me, that might have been a little confusing. Symmetry is defined as a balanced proportional similarity between two halves of an object. So the left side of your face is typically symmetrical to the right side of your face, right? Now imagine you're looking into a mirror and you raise your right arm up to wave. Your reflection waves back to you, but, but with the left hand. While this isn't symmetrical per se, it's not a huge deal, right? Because if you want to see your right hand wave in your reflection, you can just wave your left hand. There's a balance there. But for the universe, it's not so easy to correct if the symmetry or balance is off. Okay, so in particle physics, there's something called the standard model of particle physics which is scientists' best theory to describe the most basic building blocks of the universe. Among those building blocks are particles called quarks, which make up protons and neutrons. And then there are these other particles called leptons, which don't have strong interactions. Quarks and leptons make up all known matter. The laws and rules of physics are the same. A good example of this is a top. Whether you spin a top clockwise or counterclockwise, the rules of physics are the same. They are left-right symmetric. It's all balance, right? But not always. Sometimes, as Dr. Broussard points out, these beta particles, or electrons, actually care whether these particles are spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. And when this happens, these electrons choose the left-hand particles to bond with only, which kind of messes with the balance of the universe. The problem is that nobody knows why this happens. This is where dark matter comes into play, and how it ties into Dr. Broussard's mirror universe experiments. It, it seemed to be that there was rather a lot of matter in the universe that we didn't interact with, what we now, what we now call dark matter. And, and that, that evidence has, has really strengthened. And now it's, it's very conclusive that we have very strong gravitational observational evidence for, for dark matter. But it, it's, it's clear that we don't understand something about the, the, the majority of the matter in the universe. So it's, it, it was, it's interesting to think that maybe, maybe this concept of restoring symmetry with right-handed uh, a right-handed weak interaction with the second mirror universe might, might, might solve that. Dark matter is composed of particles that don't absorb, reflect, or emit light, so they can't be seen directly. 
the way we see all other matter, like trees, cars, people, animals, and pretty much anything else made up of protons, atoms, molecules, and compounds. Since it's never been seen, it's only a theory right now, a hypothetical component of our universe. But like Dr. Broussard suggests, there's very strong evidence that exists. Okay. From my point of view, I come into this story uh, firmly in our universe, uh, looking at understanding our neutron. Uh, the neutron is a subatomic particle that makes up atoms. It, all atoms are made up of electrons, and then they have a nucleus, which is made up of protons and neutrons. Um, I study the property, properties of the neutron, actually. If you take the neutron out of a nucleus, it's radioactive, and it undergoes this process of beta decay and turns into a proton. So I study that. Um, and we, we've realized in the past, well, for some time, in, in the past decade, I, I guess is where the case has really been sharpening, uh, that process of the decay of the neutron, uh, the rate at which it decays, what we call the, the half-life or the lifetime, that appears to be different depending on the kind of technique you use. If you're measuring the total rate that it disappears, it, it seems to disappear a little bit faster than if you're measuring the rate that it transforms into protons. So uh, most of our attention is, is, is focused on uh, re-evaluating all of our assumptions about how we conduct those experiments and what we might be doing wrong. And one of those assumptions is, is the neutron really only transforming into a proton, or could it be transforming into something invisible? maybe some invisible twin, like a mirror neutron. A mirror neutron in a mirror universe. So if you believe the, the mirror matter model, or if you want to work, start from the mirror matter model, it's saying it's, it's, it's a very simple extension of our knowledge. Everything is just a copy. So everything that our universe is capable of doing, it's capable of doing. So that, that's, that's just how it looks. And some, some you know, uh, universe scale observations have to be different to, to match what we observe, how we observe dark matter to behave. But it's still the same particles. So actually it would be very familiar to us. You'd still see sort of dust and, and stars. And, and if you want to know if there could be mirror, li mirror life, I, I think the first question you ask is, well, do you think there's life in our universe? Uh, that might set the scale of probability. And that's a great question that I also still can't answer, and we may never know the answer to, even if it does exist. <laughs> um, so it's it, this this kind of candidate would be very familiar, you know. If it's some other kind of you know dark neutron, some kind of neutral twin, but not necessarily mirror matter, well, it, I mean that's that would be truly exotic. It would be something adding something completely new and unknown and foreign, and I don't know what that would do. I don't know how that would interact. That, that would be pretty fascinating. I am in no way suggesting that this is the same, but I can't help but go back to what Robert Perala was saying about there being multiple Earths just like ours. Again, clearly this is not what Dr. Broussard is saying, but it does make me wonder what this could mean for Earth and reality as we know it. Talk to me about what all that means. Like for somebody <laughs> like me, who, who science background is very, very limited, what... what what does that mean on a larger scope? We know that our universe is very mysterious. I mean, it, what is dark matter? It, 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 there are a lot of, you know, kind of interesting popular candidates that we've been searching for for some time, but whatever it is, we haven't found it, so it's, it's, it's a big puzzle. Um, and if, if there is something like, you know, if mirror matter, uh, the, the, this matter that looks a lot like our matter uh, makes up part or, you know, some substantial fraction of this dark matter. I mean, dark matter could be very rich, of course. Our own matter is very rich. Um, oh man, what would that mean? I don't know. It's, 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 it, it would be very fascinating. I don't know. It's, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, you know, what, what are the implications? What could you do with this technology? I mean, it would just turn our whole, everything we know about physics upside down to realize that there could be copies of our universe coexisting with us. I mean, and maybe in a very mundane sense, you know, when people got comfortable with the idea, it would be just like, oh, there's stars in the, in the universe. Of course there are. Well, oh, there's mirror matter in the universe. Of course there is, you know, but, you know, like, what, how could we use it? What, what could that mean for us? Those are very interesting questions that I, I can't even, 
you know, I can't even, yeah, right. no. <laughs> so, would it be fair to say this is like a new dawning of physics, or is it just an extension of the standard model into an area we haven't seen yet? And are you guys pushing open a boundary, or just stepping into a new area? That's my friend Monty again. He knows a lot more about all this than I do. I actually think of it more like the latter, because okay. our, our dish, well, and, and that's unfair and that's cautious, and scientists are known for doing that. Um, because the, our description of the universe, what we call the standard model of particle physics, it's, it does a really phenomenal job of describing what we've found so far. And we, I expect that it would be a, a very kind of natural, you know, for example, just adding this, this symmetry, that's kind of a natural extension. And a lot of the physics would be the same. You know, but on the other hand, that's, this, this dark matter does appear to be very exotic. It doesn't necessarily seem to behave like our matter. So even if it is mirror matter, there is something different about it. Uh, you know, some, some theorists speculate that maybe the, the universe of mirror matter is just born as sort of colder, and that's why its behavior seems a little a little different from how our, our matter behaves. But, I mean, you know, in, in some sense, I think to the average person, yes, this is, this is turning, what, whatever we discover, if we ever discover what dark matter is, this, this would be a whole new era of that we're, they're walking into, and, and it, it could have really dramatic consequences. I think this is one of the most important problems in all of sciences. Okay. What is most of our universe made of? <laughs> so it's answering that question, I think it's probably one of the most important pursuits our humankind can, can tackle. This is only one piece of the whole project Leah's working on. So I asked her to explain how all this relates to the bigger picture of what she and her colleagues are trying to do. Sure. Um, so the, we have a lot of ideas on how to do this kind of uh, this search, this search for neutrons disappearing into something exotic. And there are a lot of, there are quite a few mechanisms by which neutrons might transform that we could be sensitive to. Um, we performed a, we, the original goal was to perform, or well, our goal ultimately, I should say, not even the original goal, it still is, is to perform most of these searches at the high flux isotope reactor, which is a very, very intense, one of the most powerful sources of neutrons for research in the world. Um, the instrument we found that we want to, to use, uh, we, we, they have a lot of what we already want out of an instrument that's designed to do this kind of search. But right now they're undergoing some upgrades of, of their instrument, which are actually kind of nice for us because it makes some of the things we want to do even easier and they're actually able to accommodate some small requests for us. So we decided we, we were kind of anxious to just to get going. So we actually performed our first search this summer at the Spallatia Neutron Source. And uh, we were able to, so that's, that experiment has happened. We were, and the universe is still here, so no, no fabric of space-time was, was ripped clearly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I don't have a pet Demogorgon. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so we, we, we were able to perform that, the Spallatia Neutron Source. Uh, we agreed ahead of time because of the overwhelming media attention. We wouldn't announce the results until we had at least some peer review, you know, to to to, to go through and and someone other than us assess what we believe we what what limits we we believe we measured, what what anomalies in, if any we think we saw. Um, that's that we all we said all of that in advance, and you know now we know what we saw, and you don't, haha. -ha. <laughs> 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 um, it, it was actually the, the, so so that that's done, and I think we can we can probably. Uh, I hope it, it won't take us very long to make to make an announcement and and you know have something kind of clear that can show the public. Okay, here's what's really going on. I asked Leah about the media reaction to her dark matter experiment because for a while I saw article after article about it. I think it it definitely sparked the public's imagination. You know, especially if if you're you're going to read quickly or maybe even only. The headline <laughs> that that might be a uh, you 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 see words like portal and parallel universe. I mean, what does that mean to the average person? I, I could tell you what it means to me. I'm going to travel through time or go do, go to another dimension or you know something really, really fantastical. And it's 
you know, I like science fiction. That's that's fine. That's it's it's cool. Um, the the but this was like a small spl a small splash. <laughs> the, uh, the the real splash came, uh, I guess, after the journalist from NBC News contacted me and, and wanted to do a follow up story and how how we were proceeding. By that time, we actually were approved to run the experiment, so we weren't just talking about things; we were real. Um, and uh, the story went live at the same time of this, you know, excellent pop culture hook. Stranger Things was released, and man, it just exploded. Every headline is uh, Tennessee scientists opening a portal to a parallel universe. Like, no! <laughs> I don't know, I, you know, and I, I had kind of mixed mixed feelings about it. I, I felt kind of bad, actually. It, it, I was worried that, you know, it was coming across like I was misleading people about what my research actually was. Uh, I think what I'm doing is really cool. But but I don't have a magic sword ripping through the fabric of space time or anything. <laughs> um, you know, actually, I'm not even opening anything. After our interview, Leah takes us on a tour of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Well, there are only a few areas in the facility that look similar to what they did in 1943, when scientists were racing against the clock to beat the Nazis and building an atomic bomb. Much of the facility has changed, and so has its mission. I learned that it's now the largest science and energy laboratory run by the U.S. Department of Energy. Not only does the lab work with neutrons, as Leah described, but it also does a lot of work around clean energy, security, computing, and nuclear power. We meet some of Leah's colleagues in the Spallation Neutron Source Facility, or SNS for short, which is where a lot of Leah's mirror universe experimentation happens. The first thing I notice is that it looks like a huge warehouse with multiple levels and lots of bright yellow staircases. There are a lot of things going on around us. Scientists working in physics, chemistry, biology, and material science. Again, I'm, I'm overwhelmed at everything I'm seeing. Everything I, I just don't understand. As we walk to Leah's area, ask her what kinds of other projects she and her team are working on. A lot of intense work is going into that kind of studies. Measuring something very precisely and looking for some small error or deviation. Something, something not quite what we predict because we know there are things like dark matter and we know there are things like why is there matter at all and not you know half the universe being made of antimatter and we're all annihilating and why are we having a podcast <laughs> um, so the, the, this is kind of an interesting a really interesting area of physics right now and also related to this question of matter is you know what what is the shape of the neutron actually that's probably one of the most well-motivated and intense areas of research uh, in, in my field is shapes of fundamental particles and the symmetry in their shape is actually related to this observed lack of symmetry. If, if, the, the, if par these fundamental particles aren't round, and we call that an electric dipole moment, if they're not round according to the electric force, um, that would tie directly to this question of why the universe happens to be made of matter and not antimatter. That there, those symmetries are very, very closely related. And so th those are two areas that I work on. Um, she then shows Monty and me where her experiment is taking place. I don't know how else to describe it except to say that there's a row of large rectangular containers that are assigned to different neuron beam experiments. Each experiment is differentiated by color. These are gold, purple, and green, which symbolizes her Cajun roots in Louisiana. As Monte and I end our time at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, something occurs to me. For years, Oak Ridge was, and still is, known as the Secret City. It was shrouded in mystery for so long, home of a top-secret U.S. government project. It's ripe for conspiracy theories. That was part of the appeal for me to visit. I asked Leah if this is something she still encounters. But that's, you know, that's, that's also historical. I mean, right. we have been, yes. we have been his mysterious, and yeah. now we're, we're very much... In, in, a, in a large way, we're an open science laboratory. And, right. you know, I think last year, like in the summers now, maybe last year, they started allowing the public to have like an, a, a day where the public can actually come and give tours. And maybe, maybe, I hope that gets less mysterious over time because yeah. I, I think a lot of what we're doing is pretty exciting. And mm -hmm. I think everyone should know that. Okay, I wasn't expecting some sort of glowing portal into a mirror universe a la Stranger Things. But talking with all these folks about mysterious energy, Pleiadians, portals, and shadow people got my imagination going as to the possibilities. Talking to Leah was a welcome relief to me. It helped ground me in reality, or at least my own reality. 
But that's the thing, right? To people like Christine, Robert, Logan, Shay, and her mom, Jennifer, that is reality for them. What they experience is their truth. Who am I to say they're wrong? I mean, science can. But even then, we're not talking about science. We're talking about beliefs and theories. What I'm struggling with here, and maybe you are too, is how people can seriously believe things like shadow people who steal lost souls and take them back to their shadow king, who, by the way, lives in another dimension. Or lizard aliens taking over our bodies so we can become Pleiadian ambassadors. Or ghosts from other realities that walk among us, checking to make sure we're okay. It's the mystery behind these beliefs, isn't it? That there's something more out there than what we can prove. It's like religion. It's all about the faith we have in something we can't prove is real. The more I think about all of this, the more I realize that to really get the perspective I need, I need to make a trip to Braley Pond, so I can see for myself just what's true and what's not. What Happened at Braley Pond is produced by me, Charlie Moss. The exceptional Bill Colrus is our story editor. Our music and sound design are by the legendary Mike Triplecock. Our website, which can be found at www.braleypondpodcast.com, was created by the outstanding Ashton Lance. Our podcast logo was designed by the phenomenal Shelton Brown. Additional artwork is by the incredibly patient Keith Finch. Special thanks to Monty Brock for his scientific insight and my wife, Vanessa, who was overwhelmingly supportive during this three-year process. Mm-hmm.